Dean, and welcome to the Berlin Women's Political Action Committee's Candidates Endorsement Forum. I'm Gina Brewer, I'm the co-chair of the Political Action Committee, and I will be moderating tonight's proceedings. I'd like to introduce the other members of our committee, Ed Boros, who's co-chair. And Chief Cookie Maker. And Chief Cookie Maker. <laughs> uh, Tamara Hall. Michelle Barney. Greg Brackbank. And um, I want to welcome our candidates in attendance tonight and thank them for joining us. We will be hearing from candidates from the following races, Congress, Assembly, Sausalito City Council, and Marin Healthcare District. Our format for this evening will be one in which each candidate will have um, two minutes to give an opening statement followed by questions uh, from the committee of oh, those people. and. Um, the audience. Eleanor Kellogg Smith will be our timekeeper for the evening. Answers will be limited to one and a half minutes. For anyone who wishes to ask a candidate a question, please fill out one of the index cards that are being passed around and collected by Greg. And we will try to address as many questions as possible within the time available. At the end of the forum, MWPAC members will conduct a caucus. This is open to members only, so non-members and the candidates will be asked to step outside until the caucus has been completed and the votes tally. Uh, members will vote and uh, we will then count the ballots and announce the results. For members who must leave before we caucus and candidates who are members, please turn in your ballots at the door as, before, as you leave. You'll be voting to recommend male candidates, recommend and endorse female candidates. In the Sausalito race, there are three women candidates and three open seats. Under our bylaws, if there are an equal number of open seats and qualified women candidates, and by qualified you mean uh, people who respond to uh, to our questionnaire. Uh, so if there's an equal number of women candidates and open seats, no man can be recommended even if one or more of the women candidates is not endorsed and even if a man gets more votes. So that's sometimes that's not popular. <laughs> I'm getting tired of having to explain that, so that's the way it is. So if you do not want your vote counted in a particular race, please choose the abstain option. If you would like to vote for no endorsement or recommendation, but have your vote counted, in other words, it'll be part of the mathematical um, counting, please choose that option. We highly recommend that MWPAC members stay to hear all the candidates uh, speak in the races so that you can give all candidates your fullest consideration. Again, thank you. And uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Huffman. Well, thank you. Uh, great to be with you. I'm honored to be your first candidate tonight. I'm even more honored to be the Democratic candidate heading into the general election against a Republican in a district that we know needs to remain Democratic. And uh, it's it is uh, great for a change to be standing before you uh, in a situation where I actually have a chance of getting your endorsement. <laughs> We've had some great conversations in the past, but I've understood that, that your rules are what they are, and I respect that. Uh, but I'm hoping very much to have your support tonight for the general election. And when it comes to women's issues, uh, I guess there are a few things that I hope you realize about me. Uh, one is that I've just got very strong democratic values that absolutely include equality, which absolutely includes equality for women as one of my highest core values. And you can see that by looking at the record that I've 
uh, compiled over six years as a state legislator. It is 100% by all of the women's organizations that conduct legislative rating. But you can also see that going back a little bit further because almost two decades ago, I was doing civil rights work as a young attorney representing women and women's organizations like uh, CalNow in Title IX and other gender equity uh, litigation. So uh, this has certainly been something that's been a core value of mine for a long, long time. And last, you can see it from the decisions that I have made. I always uh, am looking to support strong women in every way that I can. I was one of the first folks out to support Kamala Harris. I've supported any number of other women in politics. And uh, even going to the next level, if you look at the staff that I surround myself with and the way I've supported women, uh, strong women, as part of my team, uh, it, it's very much part of who I am and something that I value. You will continue to see that. Uh, if I'm your next member of Congress. I'm really proud to have the support of Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey going forward. It helps that we've become great friends, and so she's someone who will not only be a supporter, but someone I will turn to and talk with regularly. Again, I would be honored by your support. Okay, so you want to sit down because we'll be asking questions. You can sit or stand, whatever. Okay. I'm happy to stand. Okay. The, uh, the first question is, do you favor ending the Bush tax cuts? If no, why not? If yes, how do we answer concerns that raising taxes will, will hurt our fragile economic recovery? Great. Well, I absolutely favor ending the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy. I think eventually we need to roll back all of the tax rates to where they were under the Clinton administration. But I think the middle class is hurting and the, the economy is fragile enough right now that the first step ought to just be rolling back uh, the tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. I don't think that's going to stall uh, the economic recovery at all. In fact, I think we need to do even more tax fairness uh, on that end of the scale. And let's take some of that revenue and invest it in public infrastructure and ladders of opportunity to regrow the middle class and do things that will really get the economy moving. Okay, we have a couple from the audience. Uh, this one is an easy one. Where will you be living in D.C.? Good question. Uh, I try not to think about that a lot because I have to win this election in November. Uh, but assuming all that goes well, I, I really don't know. My family and I are going to have to work that out. And the great news for me uh, is that I have a family that's ready to do whatever makes the most sense for me. So uh, I don't yet know if my kids will continue to uh, be in the wonderful Marin County schools or whether we'll have to find something closer to Washington, D.C., but we'll, we'll figure that out next year, I hope. Okay, this is a question from, from the audience. Um, will you in Congress introduce legislation to abolish dumping plastic garbage uh, bags in U.S. oceans? Well, plastic garbage, not just bags. Sure. I, I am very concerned about the marine debris problem and uh, have either uh, authored or co-authored lots of pieces of legislation that uh, are intended to, to help reduce marine debris. I, I can't tell you that I will introduce that kind of legislation because the way it works in Congress is particularly in your first few years, you don't get to introduce a lot of legislation. <laughs> I can tell you I will absolutely support it and co-sponsor and do everything I can uh, to reduce the amount of plastics in our society and to take some very bold steps towards reducing marine debris. I applaud uh, Supervisor Adams and her colleagues for, for really showing some great leadership on the plastic bag issue, lots of uh, leadership. <laughs> And, and I'm going to do my part from Congress, absolutely. What are your main priorities when you get to Congress? Well, Question from the audience. Sure. Well, look, I think the big issue right now in our country uh, is, is our economy in the middle class. And I think what you really haven't, and you saw this so clearly by watching the two <coughs> conventions the last two weeks, you've got very, very different visions of what the American dream is and what this, this whole uh, opportunity society is. For the Republicans, it's a very scaled back version of what I've always thought the American dream was, and it's, it's really opportunity for those that are already very, very well off. Uh, for the Democrats, I was very proud to be part of a party that uh, believes in ladders of opportunity for everyone, and that includes immigrants, it includes minorities and women, uh, it includes the LGBT community. I was so proud of the way we really expressed the breadth uh, of our values and, and of our coalition. And uh, that's really, I think, what it's all about in, in the years ahead, making sure that there's opportunity for everyone in this country 
to get a good education, to have accessible, affordable health care, and to get a good middle class job that hopefully is also part of a clean energy economy that's beginning to tackle and do our part on climate change. So one of the big issues that we see, uh, I'm failing the don't touch it thing. Um, one of the big issues we're seeing is uh, the right to choose being um, threatened and certain states trying to shut those opportunities down. It, what can you do at federal or are you going to do anything at the federal level to try to maybe override what states are trying sure. to do? Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, I'm, the, the answer is everything I possibly can. Uh, a woman's right to reproductive choice is just non-negotiable. It's not something you compromise about. So uh, it's one of those areas where I actually do think the federal government uh, needs to be very proactive and preemptive uh, as these states try to erode a woman's right to choose in all sorts of insidious ways. Okay, um, how can the federal government protect Social Security, which is many women's only source of income? Well, you know, I think the answer to that question is a lot simpler than it may seem. I think the, the Social Security crisis has been greatly exaggerated. Uh, if we simply raise the wage cap on Social Security, you're going to see the numbers change dramatically for the better. Now, Social Security is not on the verge of going insolvent, by the way. Uh, it's, it's doing much better, in fact, than, than Medicare in terms of its projected uh, stability. But by raising that wage cap, we are decades into the future uh, with a program that's, that's really a, a core program that we have to continue to support, and I refuse to privatize it. Uh, I want to not reduce the, the benefits at all. Um, the, the last thing, though, that, that we can and should do is get more younger people into the workforce paying into the system. That's going to do more for both Social Security and Medicare uh, than any of the things that are being bandied about right now as so-called reforms. How do you view the illegal immigration situation, what choices are there for the federal government or is this a state-by-state -state, uh, challenge? Well, it's definitely not a state-by-state -state challenge. Immigration policy is a function of federal law and uh, I'm with the president absolutely on this. Uh, I, I applaud that he has taken the, the initial step that he can without Congress because Congress isn't ready to go there yet, but his deferral I think is a great step uh, I think the next step is definitely the full array of uh, reforms that we've talked about in comprehensive immigration reform. That includes a path to citizenship uh, for anybody in this country who's willing to get in line, play by the rules, get an education, pay their taxes, learn English. Absolutely, they should have an opportunity to become citizens. And then there should be special opportunities for folks who are willing to get a college degree, serve in our military. That's the DREAM Act, uh, of which I was a proud sponsor and supporter of the California DREAM Act. We need to do that at the federal level as well. Sounds like we can count on your support for uh, possibly trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed. I, I would love to see it. it. It's what stalled a few states short of, uh, of enactment, but absolutely I would support that. 56% of all women rely on Medicare. There's a campaign talk of any Medicare as we know it. Medical costs are rising faster than the GDP. What are your proposals to keep Medicare solvent? Please address the age factor, cost of living caps, vouchers, and payroll tax rates. Uh, well, first of all, this idea of voucherizing or couponizing Medicare is, is completely unacceptable to me. Uh, I also oppose reductions in benefits right now. I, I mean, like most of the people here, uh, I have relatives who are seniors on fixed monthly incomes, and uh, it, it would just be devastating for them to see any rollback in Medicare benefits. So. Uh, that's off the table, in my opinion. Uh, the one thing that I know we have to do to save Medicare is to stay the course on the Affordable Care Act, because the $700 billion a year in reduced health care costs that we're going to get from Obamacare is essential to keeping Medicare solvent into the future. If you actually did the Romney-Ryan plan of repealing the Affordable Care Act and then also voucherizing Medicare, uh, as we heard last week, suddenly you're talking about uh, insolvency of Medicare, not in the distant future, but actually in the next four years. So uh, we are absolutely on the right side of this issue, and, and we need to press forward. The Violence Against Women Act expired in 2011 and is yet to be reauthored. Re uh, how would you go about getting this off, uh, authored? Authorized. 
authorized? Well, I, I, I think the first thing I will do is go out and try to win 25 seats in the House of Representatives, including my own, uh, because I think that uh, is probably going to be the secret to passing all of the good legislation that we would all like to see uh, in the next Congress. So uh, the, the answer is largely a political one, and it's about getting the votes to actually pass the legislation. Uh, from the audience, Congress's popularity is at all-time lows for a variety of reasons. What would you bring to the table to change Congress's popularity? Terrific opportunity to go into Congress when the bar is very low. <laughs> I'm very excited about bringing it up, and, and I think uh, the key to bringing it up, look, we're, we're in a terrible economic situation right now. That's a huge contributor to why uh, folks are not happy with Congress, but Congress also has performed just terribly. Uh, I think the worst Congress I've seen in my lifetime in terms of just dysfunction and, and outright hostility to governing. So uh, we, again, have to win some seats this fall, and we've got to change some of the faces in Congress. But I believe we may not fully get to the 25. We need to take back the majority in the House of Representatives. I think we're going to, at a minimum, though, close, close the, uh, the size of that majority on the Republican side. That's going to force them to actually work with Democrats. And I firmly believe once you start to get things done, in Congress and, and people see that you're at least trying to solve problems instead of just fighting about them, those approval ratings are gonna, gonna come up. And uh, that is the kind of legislator I am. I bring strong core values to the work that I do. Uh, I don't compromise on core values, but I also have the ability to get along with folks and find solutions and solve problems. It's your turn. Okay. Uh, deficit reduction in the U.S. is critical necessity. Can you specifically cite actions and policies that you would favor to reduce our debt? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is something that you, you cannot ignore, and uh, I was pleased to see most of the uh, most of the prime time Democratic speakers acknowledge that we we are serious about the debt and we are serious about the deficit in the Democratic Party. But we believe that the right way to do it uh, is not through extreme austerity, where all you do is cut everything except the military. Uh, and then you actually run the risk of driving this fragile economic recovery back into the recession. Uh, you've got to take a balanced approach. And so, yes, we need to find more efficiencies in government. Uh, I would say the place where you've got to start to get the real money uh, that you're going to need is with the military budget. It's too big. Uh, by way of one of many illustrations I could give, did you know that we have the two largest air forces in the world? The United States Air Force is the largest in the world. The United States Navy is the second largest air force in the world. I think clearly uh, we've got room to cut a lot and achieve a peace dividend with the military budget. Uh, and then, of course, tax fairness and, and the revenue side has to be on the table if we're going to tackle that and deficit seriously. This is not on our list, but where is Dan Roberts? <laughs> Dan, are you? <laughs> he was uh, given the opportunity to come, and he, we never heard back from him. He, he got a questionnaire. I did talk with him personally. But, uh, and he sounded friendly, <laughs> but uh, he hadn't seen our questionnaire yet, so he may have changed his mind. Now, the actual question is, what is your strategy to combat forces in the House to wipe out our national family planning program, Title IX? Well, again, this is a fundamentally different vision uh, of the American dream and the importance of the middle class and opportunity for everyone. I think a social safety net is absolutely part of that, always has been since the 1930s, and uh, I think has to be going forward. And so uh, one of the themes that you saw playing out in Charlotte over and over again was we all had a stake in each other. You know, I am my brother's keeper and my sister's keeper. That's the Democratic Party. The Republican theme, unfortunately, is sort of everyone's in it for themselves. So uh, I'm a proud Democrat on these issues, and I'm going to support uh, an adequate uh, safety net to take care of folks when they need that help. Thank you. This one's from the audience. If you could introduce legislation that would be a benefit to Marin residents and protect residents here and nationwide from air pollution, especially respirable particulates, what would you propose? Well, the Clean Air Act is already taken. It's a pretty good one. Uh, I think what we need to do is make sure that we're enforcing it. And uh, especially at times like this, when the economy is not going so well, we do often see our environmental and public health values pitted against jobs and economic growth as choices. I don't think that uh, they ought to be pitted uh, against each other in that way. So 
Uh, you're going to see me supporting economic growth and investments and policies that create jobs, but I'm, I'm not at all prepared to roll back clean air standards. And if anything, if you look around in the Central Valley and other places where we've got chronic asthma and other uh, unacceptable conditions that are contributing, by the way, to our rising health care costs, I think the premium on uh, clean air and public health is, is greater than it's ever been. Speaking of the environment, um, what is your, your um, feeling? What are your feelings about opening the wilderness to Alaska wilderness to uh, oil exploration? No way. <laughs> Attempts are being made through throughout the Supreme Court to get the enforcement and the availability of the Family and Medical Leave Act. Uh, what do you know about this act, and how could you, how could it be protected? The first part of your question referred to the Supreme Court. Did, did I get that right? Yes. Attempts are being made throughout the Supreme Court to get the enforcement. To gut. To gut. gut. To gut. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's to gut the enforcement and availability of the Family and Medical Leave Act. What do you know about this act, and how? Could it be protected? Well, I'm familiar with the Act, and I, I certainly support the policy of providing family medical leave. I'm not familiar with whatever's going on with the Supreme Court, so unfortunately, I, I'm not exactly sure uh, what that question is about. I'm not either. What would you to that Act? Isn't that the question? Pardon me? Isn't the question, would you, is it, if the Act were to be gutted, what would you do about it? Yes. Well, I, I'm not going to let the act be gutted legislatively. Uh, for the Supreme Court to gut it, it would have to find some kind of a constitutional problem. And, uh, you know, I, I think we just, I need to better understand what this gutting uh, allegation is all about. So that's all the questions that we have and that we've received from the audience, unless there's any more. We have to write it on a card. The yeah. most important issue, <coughs> Jonathan, is nothing verbal, please. What's that? Nothing verbal. You'll have to write it on the card. Oh, okay. Forget it, then. <laughs> <laughs> I can't write. Okay. They already have it. Oh, we have another one? They already have my question. Oh. We already asked that question. Where he's going to live? Yeah. We asked that. <laughs> West side. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Any more, any looks more like cards? One, I got one, one more. more. One more. Okay. Any others? Calling ones. It says, what can be done to bring back antitrust law and halt legislation by corporations? What is your stance on campaign reform? Wow, that's a big question with not a lot of time. Uh, in terms of campaign reform, I am a firm supporter of the move to amend. Uh, I would love to find some way legislatively through Congress to roll back Citizens United and do all yeah. the things that I would like to do, including public financing of campaigns. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court has made that virtually impossible with really 30 years of rulings that are going to require either a new Supreme Court, which I'm not going to be able to control, uh, or a constitutional amendment, which perhaps I can help make happen. And I hope all of you will help with that, too. So it's moved to amend, and you could Google it and, and uh, sign the petitions that I hope will lead to an actual formal uh, effort to pass a new constitutional amendment that clarifies really what all of us know, and that is that uh, money is not speech for First Amendment purposes, and that we can regulate both contributions and spending in order to protect the integrity of our political process. The antitrust piece, uh, I think, again, it's a matter of enforcement. We actually have some good environment, uh, antitrust laws on the books, but I agree with the proposition that enforcement and, and policies have been tilted too much in favor of the big guys. And, and not enough in favor of competition and, and smaller businesses, and I'll try to do my best to support that. All right, we have another one from the audience. What's your position on restoring Drake's Estero to wilderness? Yeah. Oh, easy little question. The easy yeah. question. Uh, uh, I, I don't have a position yet, so uh, I apologize for uh, that, but uh, I'm watching closely what's going on right now with the Department of Interior. Uh, I have good relationships with both sides of this debate. Uh, I've been meeting and getting updated by both sides, and you know, we're going to see what the Secretary decides here probably in a few months. Um, 
I think it's a, it's a pretty special place, the Estero. And there's obviously a reason why uh, that was legislative designated, uh, legislatively designated as potential wilderness. Uh, on the other hand, I think the ag community and the ag character of West Marin is very important. And so uh, I'm just going to you know, take those principles with me, see what the secretary decides, and uh, you know, that decision may take care of it. But uh, my guess is there may be some uh, temporary extension, but a longer term move towards a permanent wilderness status. That might be the possible workings of a compromise that, that we could all perhaps support. Maybe not. Maybe in laps. <laughs> 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 no more questions. Okay. All right, um, Mr. Hoffman, we, um, a one minute summary of whatever you want to make sure everybody remembers. Well, in, in one minute, I hope what you remember is that uh, I've been working hard for this district for a long time, uh, that I feel like I'm a legislator that reflects the values, the strong democratic and progressive values of this district, but also uh, somebody that I hope you believe uh, has the skills uh, and the ability to get things done, which is one of the real problems with the current Congress and one of the things that we need to restore, the ability to solve problems and get results. So I, I know that I've got huge shoes to fill. Uh, we've had a fantastic representative for the last 20 years, uh, but my commitment to you uh, is to work as hard as I possibly can to give you the best representation that I can. And I hope you'll support me. I hope you'll go to jaredhuffman.com and become part of my com uh, campaign. And very much appreciate the opportunity to visit with you tonight. Okay, now um, will the candidates for Sausalito City Council please uh, come forward. Then you can sit up there wherever you want. Everyone. I wanted to thank the Bryn Women's Political Action Committee tonight for this opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, I appreciate your organization and I appreciate the opportunity to get to talk to you. Um, my name is Vicki Nichols and I'm a 30-year Sausalito resident. Um, I have been attending city council meetings and planning commissions for years and during the last 13 years I decided to start applying some of my interest and have been serving on uh, committees, boards, steering committees uh, that have involved some of the important issues in, in Sausalito, including our public safety buildings, um, acting as a chair as our recent bond issue, um, studying waterfront environmental and historical resource issues, preservation of our historical buildings and sites. I recently attended the environmental forum this year, so I'm fully up to speed on my um, environmental um, information and hope is elected to apply that to uh, working with our sustainability committee. We've just gotten a $26,000 grant, so I'm hoping to move towards zero waste. Um, I uh, am also inviting you to Coastal Cleanup next, win uh, next Saturday, too, if you haven't signed up. I've been the um, site captain for three years down in Sausalito. That's a worthy activity. But I'll bring my financial background, my corporate financial background to this city. Um, I, I want to use that experience. I'm very concerned and interested in keeping Sausalito's financial solvency in good shape. We're in good shape now. And I'm very familiar with other issues. So I'm looking forward to uh, digging right in. Thank you. I'm Ray Withy. Thank you for inviting me to this event. Um, your group plays an important role, and I'm honored to be here. Marin County offers a wonderful quality of life to its families. Each town and community is different and special, and I want my elected officials to protect our quality of life. That's why I'm running for the Sausalito City Council. For Sausalito, first, I will work to protect its village-like atmosphere, its waterfront, its neighborhoods, and its historic legacy. Second, 
I will work to ensure that the city is a sustainable source of revenue to continue to deliver services. Financially, the city administration has managed the city well. Our challenge for the next four years is to ensure that this sound financial stewardship continues. Importantly, we must promote economic vitality within our business community so that we can improve our sewers, invest more in our parks and our playgrounds. We must in also engage in constructive dialogue on important topics, including difficult ones. I was a member of the City's Housing Element Task Force. We delivered a new draft housing chapter, which was moderate, balanced, and had multiple strategies so that no one strategy had to be extreme. I listened to all points of view, for you never know where the good idea is coming from. I spent my career working as a business leader in the biotech industry, developing medicines for serious diseases like cancer. I have had me led many diverse teams on complex pro projects. I have a PhD in biochemistry and originally worked as a scientist. That taught me to keep an open mind, respect the facts, and analyze data objectively. This discipline has served me well, and I hope to use it as a city council member. Thank you. I'm Tom Theodorus. Thank you to the committee for inviting me. This is my first um, run of, of public office. And after I received the committee's questionnaire, I thought that was the end of my career. But it was, um, it was really, I really appreciate it because it, it, it sensitized me and uh, made me spend quite a bit of time uh, analyzing the women's issues involved. Second. Uh, Could they turn theirs off? Oh, yeah. I think that's causing a, an echo. Oh, okay. is this better? Yeah. Okay. Can't, move, can't move the microphone, new microphone, it's just the buttons. Okay. So, Sausalito is ready for a change on its city council, and November 6th will give us a chance for that change. Sausalito is the vital, unique small town that we all love with its amazing natural resources and dedicated residents and solid city government. And the job of the city council is to lead our community in preserving and enhancing these natural gifts. And, and I'm committed to providing this constructive, balanced leadership that's needed to bring us together. Uh, I ser I've served on the Sausalito Historic Landmarks Board for four years and served on its chair as its chair for two of those years. And during that time, I provided this constructive, independent leadership. During my Historic Landmarks Board tenure, we protected Sausalito's historic character well, at the same time, we respected the concerns of the homeowners and businesses that came before us. Our goal was to proactively help the property owners maintain and enhance their property while maintaining their historic character. My professional career was as an attorney and corporate counsel for a major high-tech corporation. I also served as a member of boards for various nonprofit organizations, and in these groups, I work to bring together disparate groups to reach solutions that benefited everyone. The values I would bring to my service on the City Council are respect for others and their opinions, a positive can-do approach, commitment to truth in government, consensus building and fairness. City Hall's purpose is to be responsive to and serve the entire community. If elected, I promise not to lose sight of these values. Thank you. The first question uh, is going to be directed to you, Mr. Theodorus, and then Mr. Whitley, Ms. Nichols, and Ms. Pfeiffer. Sausalito's long frontage on the bay makes it particularly susceptible to sea level rise. What adaption, adap adaptations would you support on the City Council? To prevent the rising of the right, well, <laughs> that's almost as hard as that questionnaire. Uh, the it, it would it would really depend. I we would have to study what we have, and we've done some studies, and I know that the um, WAM report for us has done some on that. But it's it's we'd have to study it, and and I would support whatever would be necessary, of course, with trying at, at the greatest possibility to preserve our historic character of the waterfront, while at the same time, we may have things that we have to do. I'm just not familiar with the science on it at this point. 
Mr. Wafer. This is a very difficult uh, topic um, for a number of reasons. First of all, we're not going to be able to stop the um, sea from rising uh, without obviously long-term uh, climate change plans, but that's not in the power of the Sausalito City Council, unfortunately. <laughs> um, what we can do, however, is figure out, is there remediation efforts that we can uh, make along the waterfront? And I very much support our business advisory committee, which is um, uh, beginning to analyze what infrastructure improvements we can make uh, to help uh, some of the businesses and some of the buildings there um, that are becoming waterlogged during uh, bad storms. Um, finally, we need to be able to talk about it because often um, the waterfront area seems to be so uh, provocative that nobody seems to even begin to address it and to find out is there some common solutions. So I would uh, certainly promote a uh, dialogue. Vicky? Um, I actually was um, I actually was one of the members of the WAM committee, which was uh, established by the city council to study waterfront issues, waterfront and marine ship areas, and uh, one of the areas that I looked at was the physical environment and the environmental area uh, qualities down there. So I'm familiar with this, and as my two um, other candidates have said before me, this is a huge problem. And I think that the only way that we're going to really have a comprehensive way to solve this in Marin County is that all this, the, the municipalities around the bay get together for a solution. Um, we're going to have to mitigate and adapt. The sea level rise is going to happen. Um, there's been some interest with um, our uh, local supervisor, Ms. Sears, who I've talked to briefly about this. Um, and she has mentioned that she would like to get together a county um, committee that we could be, begin discussions. An example would be if Sausalito puts up a, a jetty and Puerto Madera puts up levees and you know you have this, this uh, these uh, um, patch approaches. It, it needs to be comprehensive. Um, Will Travis who just retired from BCDC is studying this around the whole Bay Area now so it's a huge problem but we need to get into the conversation and be represented. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, you can't stop Mother Nature. Um, and this isn't just a Sausalito uh, problem. Uh, I, I would support any studies. Clearly, we don't have the answers now. We're just at the beginning of fully understanding uh, the challenges ahead. And it does seem to me like it's going to be a collaborative um, effort with other towns and other cities. Uh, so um, I know I've reviewed the WAM report, the waterfront um, report they referred to earlier. We have the Marin ship, part of it is sinking half an inch a year. We have, uh, you know, the, the uh, sea level, you know, rising predictions there. So we're just, it's early days and uh, clearly we have a lot of ground to cover and a lot of um, research ahead. Thank you. So we're talking about water, and let's talk about some of the things that live on the water, like the anchor outs. What are you going to do to try to regulate the anchor outs? And I think we start with Mr. Withy. Yeah. Um, the anchor outs are uh, both potentially a problem, but also a, a perceived uh, problem. Um, basically, for those <coughs> in the audience that don't know what we're talking about, there are people that um, live on their boats um, out into the bay. They can cause a hazard, they can be dangerous, they can be unsanitary. But these folks are poor often and um, are, you could classify, almost as homeless. Our police chief believes that um, the best approach is to actually get out there, help them, provide them health care, provide them uh, the support services that the county can provide, because technically they're not doing anything illegal and they're probably not impacting any crime in Sausalito. Thank you. Thank you. This is a question that um, 
and a, and a subject that um, spurred the houseboat wars in the 70s. And fundamentally, you have, a, you have a tension with laws that say you can't live on the bay, you're considered filth. And you have this historic style of life that Sausalito is, is part of Sausalito's character. So um, this one is big. <laughs> I um, fully support Chief Tejada's approach now. She has actually been able to go out and, as Ray says, and work with some of these people. There's also talk about mooring fields, too. So I'm not sure what the solution is. I am emotionally torn between the two historical uses and uh, but I do know that the law says that they're not supposed to be out there. So um, our local harbor master deals with this all the time. I think that um, I would, you know, be involved in these conversations. Um, I don't know what the solution is. It's complicated. So. Uh, I guess I would say that I know the RBRA, a key charter of the RBRA is uh, to um, manage the anchor boat uh, situation. I also support uh, Chief uh, Tahada's efforts with respect to she's um, gone out and, and helped those who wanted to relocate and find homes on shore. She's helped them uh, with, uh, you know, find housing, which is great. Uh, I do have concerns uh, with uh, the environment uh, when their anchors, you know, rip up the eelgrass, and so it's a complex issue, and it's um, an another one that uh, really I think a lot more research needs to be done in terms of the appropriate way forward. I agree, it's a difficult issue, and I support Sausalito's current what I'd call soft approach to it instead of trying just to. Um, Read, read the uh, waterfront of these um, anchor outs. And I also support Chief Tejada's approach to it as assistance and treating them uh, as people who have certain uh, service needs and including medical and other type needs that they may have. Uh, I do think we have to be uh, cognizant of any potential problems with pollution of the bay from these people and we have to make sure that we're uh, cautious about that. And I also would um, recommend that we very um, that we limit them to current anchor routes, and we have to be careful that we don't encourage others to adopt that lifestyle. Thank you. So, a question from the audience. Um, it's directed to Linda Pfeiffer, but I think we can expand it for everybody. Um, for Linda, what are your uh, specific accomplish what are your specific accomplishments during your term, and what was your most important contribution to the city of Sausalito to date? And to expand that for the other candidates, um, what are your accomplishments and contributions that you think will be, that, that you will bring to the city council? Well, I would say uh, one accomplishment of my, I'm very proud of is community outreach. Um, my doctorate is in education, my master's is in instructional technology, and um, uh, I believe in education, I believe in knowledge, I believe in community outreach. And um, I have done a lot of that. I do town hall forums uh, where people can come and ask questions about any issue they like before a council meeting. Uh, I do a number of um, meet and greets in the community at each region of Sausalito. Um, I also uh, uh, made a contribution with respect to the housing uh, element. I led the first ever survey of liveaboards in Sausalito as well as the first ever survey of second units in Sausalito. The liveaboards are not the anchor outs. The liveaboards are people who live on sailboats in our marinas and um, they pay for, you know, living in the slips and their, um, their uh, the waste is collected in environmentally sensitive ways, and yet they were kind of under the radar in our community. So it's important to put them on the map and include them in our housing element. My major so uh, service to Sausalito has been to serve on the Sausalito Historic Landmarks Board for four years, uh, two of them as the chair. And during that time, I think one of our major accomplishments was uh, to uh, uh, was our approach was we certainly wanted to preserve 
uh, our historic district and all our historic buildings, but we also had the approach of proactively helping our businesses and, and homeowners to maintain their properties. And at many times we would uh, uh, help them and, and, and give them advice that would improve their property well beyond uh, what it might be for historic values. And then the other, our major accomplishment on that board, of which Vicki Nichols was on as well, was we passed the historic design guidelines. So these are guidelines that homeowners can use before they come before our board to know what they can and can't do on historic properties. Thank you. My first involvement with the city was informally uh, as a resident uh, working with the legislative committee to uh, um, look at uh, putting limits on construction uh, time limits because it was becoming a, a significant problem within the city. Um, but I formally became involved when I was asked by the then current mayor to join the Housing Element Task Force. And on that task force, um, we produced a, a balanced, um, moderate, I think well thought out plan, which involved multiple strategies. And as I said earlier, when you have multiple strategies, no one strategy needs to be extreme. That's currently in front of our planning commission and uh, city council. And uh, right now I'm involved in uh, writing the legislation for um, our, our ordinance to cover accessory dwelling units, which is a new thing for Sausalito. As I mentioned, whoops. As I mentioned, I started uh, volunteering on city committees um, back in about 2000, 1999, and I first uh, worked on the wireless ordinance, telecommunication ordinance. And since then, as I look at this list, most of my involvement has been um, efforts that have had a financial impact on the city to the good. So um, I uh, worked on the Yes on Yes Committee, which was the public um, bond issue for our public safety buildings. It passed with 80% on a mail-in ballot. I'm very proud of that. And I'm not claiming all the credit for this because there was a team, obviously. Um, but we promised the citizens that there would be a review committee and if any money was left over, we'd give it back to them. And there was $2 million surplus that was returned to the taxpayers. Um, I just recently worked as the treasurer on Measure S, which allowed the annexation of our Sausalito, uh, sorry, e, sorry, Gray, Ray was the co-treasurer, um, Measure D, which allowed the annexation of our police and fire, which has made the city solvent, so I'm proud of that. Do we have time for another? Uh, Linda. Linda. I'm sorry. Linda, Linda started. Oh, I'm sorry. She started. Yeah. Do we have time for one more? We have time for one more. Okay. This is, question is from the audience. What are you going to do to keep residents actively engaged in city politics and important issues? Well, for me, it goes back to education because uh, we get overwhelmed, I think, with information and data. We're always connected to our Blackberries and our um, cell phones and our computers and everything, and uh, we get overwhelmed with information and data. So the ability to take that information and convert it into knowledge in terms of how it impacts you at a local level is the best way to motivate people to get involved in your community locally. Because if you know something's going to happen you know, uh, near and around you, you're more likely to be interested and learn a little bit more. Uh, information propagation is the best way. I think one is we have an email, and, and certainly in Sausalito we have an email to citizens about keeping them informed of everything that goes on, and I think we get emails at least once a week on that. And I think that's really important to keep them, in this day and age, electronic media is, as well, as well as the public hearings on various issues that we have. And, and there's, um, uh, so that citizens have a chance to see the process in person, so that's the other side of the electronic uh, world we live in, and to give their input on very important issues, and certainly issues that affect the waterfront or any of our major issues should be, um, uh, we, we have public hearings on, and we should encourage you to keep that up. Thank you. We do have a lot of uh, communication within the city. The city administration is very good about keeping everybody informed. Um, for me personally, 
Uh, I think residents want to see their city councils being relevant and their city council solving problems. And that means their city council working together. In my view, uh, cooperation is much better than obstruction. Um, healthy communication is a lot better um, than obstruct, you know, than uh, basically obstruction. And so um, I think if the community sees that their council members are working together to solve problems for them in a respectful, uh, collegial way, then I think more people will get involved because they will become inspired. I have to say on that one, I couldn't agree with Ray more. Um, I was going to uh, say that we have to slightly address the elephant in the room, and Sausalito has gotten some bad publicity lately to make an understatement. Um, I uh, pledge that if I'm elected, I'm going to work the hardest to cooperate. I've actually worked and know everybody up here, so um, I've worked with many diverse groups in our community that are not on the same page at all but we've been able to at least be respectful during the process and get our work done and get, get our reports done. So I think that's important and I do think that's why people have turned off somewhat. So I'd like to change our tone around and get people to come back in and participate. We have a wonderful volunteer community in Sausalito, very involved. Okay, everybody can uh, just do a brief summary, a minute or less. Why would you start with Gina? What? Okay. Thank you, Gina. I want to thank everybody else for um, for being here today at, or tonight again. Uh, I ask for your endorsement. Uh, this organization does great work. Uh, you do ama amazing outreach uh, for women. And again, as a uh, current city council member in, in Sausalito, I've seen firsthand how women active in politics can really make a difference. Uh, in my role uh, in city council, I have lived my values, integrity, honesty, uh, say saying uh, and doing what I believe is in the best interest for our citizens, our community, uh, and uh, the things that I believe in, and uh, I ask for your support and your endorsement, and I thank you very much for hosting this tonight. I thank you all. Yeah, when do we go? Oh, I have oh. a, I, I have a, yeah, we can go left or right. Sorry. <laughs> um, in the race for city, for Sausalito City Council, seven excellent candidates with a broad, wide range of skills are competing for three open seats. Between now and November 6th, we're going to learn a lot about current issues in Sausalito and we'll get to know a fair amount about each other. Recently, I've been reading Team of Rivals, a biography of Abraham Lincoln and his extraordinary cabinet who put aside rivalry to get a difficult and important job done. I'd like to be part of such a team and I believe we have that opportunity. As I said earlier, I hope to be known as a cons council member who never allows disagreement to turn to disrespect, who listens to all sides of an issue, and who speaks with the voice of reason. I am very sorry I could not be present Thank you, Marin Women's Pack, for inviting me to speak. I would be honored to have your endorsement. I want to bring my years of experience uh, to Sausalito as one of the next city council member. I believe that a council person's role is to make decisions based on factual information that is, are the, that is for the benefit of our whole community, not just a small interest. Um, I pledge to review the issues thoroughly, um, hear the community concerns, I believe in an open public process, um, and I want a city council that acts in a civil and respectful manner. Um, as I mentioned, I've worked with many diverse groups in Sausalito. I can make um, health groups reach consensus. And I know how to roll up my sleeves and get the job done. I've demonstrated that. So now I need your help to get started. I ask for your vote. Thank you. Well, once again, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, 
You play an important role, as I said earlier. Uh, I'm sorry you can't recommend me, but I respect your bylaws. Um, as, a, as a Sausalito City Council member, I also pledge to work uh, constructively, cordially, conge with congeniality, um, and with respect for everybody. Um, this has not been the case always. I think uh, I bring, as uh, from my business background and as a scientist, as I've said, a respect for the facts. The facts are the facts. We need to analyze information prudently and objectively, and we need to come to conclusions that benefit the whole community, not just a noisy minority. So that's what I pledge, economic vitality, protecting our quality of life, and um, I, I look forward to at least your informal recommendation. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. And the values I would bring to the, my service on the City Council are, as the others have said, I think first and foremost, we need respect for others and their opinions. And to be able to hear others and their opinions and to treat, treat them all in a respectful way and a, a commitment to truth in the process of governing and dissemination of information as we talked how important information is. But it's very important that we're, we're truthful in that dissemination of, of, of the information. And I'm, I'm committed to consensus building and fairness in the process. My vision for Sausalito is a Sausalito that retains its unique small town charm and attributes it has a plan and vision for how to bring that forward into the future. And I also like a Sausalito that would be welcoming to my children and a place where they would choose to live just the way my wife and I am. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.